Hey, what is going on guys? And welcome back to the College Info Geek Podcast, the internet's best resource for getting ahead as a student, but a terrible resource for learning how to win your next rap battle. And it's here as good. always with my good friend, Martin Bamey. My name's Thomas Frank. And we're not rap battlers. I'm not a rapper. No. I'm about to end your whole career. That's true. I, whole career. I've written rap and I like to freestyle, but it's all way too dumb to win a rap battle. It would only confuse <laughs> the audience. That could be a that could be a viable strategy though. It, I mean, it could be depending on the audience. Yeah, I mean, look, if I could make that confusion audience, come across as like awe, yes. then then it looks like I win. The type of audience that you are appealing to matters almost as much as the content. Yeah, that's coming out of your mouth during the battle. It does. So, so there's there's a little bit of a freestyle tip. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. cater to your audience. Dang, I said it wasn't a good resource oh, for no. your next rap battle, but it is now. College Rap Battle Geek Podcast. <laughs> That'd be fun to work on, but a disaster. Okay. One episode comes out on April 1st. Anyway, uh, today we are doing another personal finance episode. I don't think we've done one of these in a while. That's because I just hate money. As in like possibly a hundred episodes a while? Uh, wait, a hundred? That's well, a long our, time if that's true. Wasn't our budgeting episode like 177 I don't, or something? See, I don't remember any of the numbers like you do. And then in my brain, I was so like... I have no idea. Well, let's find out. In my brain, I was like, uh, oh, we're on like, what, episode 240 something? No. No, where were we? I think we're at 277. See, and that doesn't sound very different, but considering that this podcast doesn't even come out weekly now, nope, this is a long time. Nope. All right. Well, we've done five question stuff, but here we go. How to budget. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've touched on stuff in five coffee. questions. That was 2017. And then we what? had the investing episode, which I believe was, two was years. before that one. Two years. Yeah. We're dead. So I don't think we've done a money episode. We're dead. How unless, unless you count last week's episode on investing in new gear, but that wasn't really about money. Yeah, that was more about the we've gear than about, the like, money involved. Moving to new cities, but you know, we haven't really dug into the dirty details of how to keep more dollar bills in your pocket. So that's what we're doing this week. Oh, buying versus renting a home. I oh, would that's call another that one. That's... a money episode. Sort of. Yeah, but it's not of. like... Not oh, everybody can use that very well. How to well. get out of debt as fast as possible. We did that one, episode 238. Oh, there it is. That was That's the most recent. That was almost a year ago. That was, so, yeah. that, even that was almost a year ago? Roughly once a year, you get a money <sighs> episode from us. Look, you can't expect me to do more because I spent three years doing Listen Money Matters and talking about money That's anywhere fair. from once per week to three times per week. So I have to get psyched up for three it. Three times? When we look. So I, I won't say launched because Listen Money Matters was a podcast before I was the host for, I think, a year and a half. But when we launched season two and I was the co-host, we were three times a week. I don't even understand how to have that much to talk about. There's a lot that you can talk about in money. What's Forex trading? What's the gold standard? What does the Federal Reserve do? What's fractional um, banking? How the does answer to all work? of those is dumb. So it's, well, the last, one, the, you can, the last one you can't say dumb because it's how does Bitcoin work? Dumbly. Dumbly. <laughs> <laughs> you need an adverb. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What is the Federal Reserve? Dumb. <laughs> what's the gold standard? Dumb. Well, what's not dumb? I don't know, man. Like hyper communism. I like that is way more hyper than regular communism. It's, I don't know if I'm ready. It's for hyper communism. It. I don't know if I'm ready. Yep. <laughs> we all just okay. Build one giant house and we all live in it. Everything. I think that's just called the Earth, man. Exactly. We all sleep outdoors. Yeah, but we, we get any tents. individualism whatsoever is not allowed. You got a tent, it better fit everyone. Okay, that's fair. Yep. So you're in the big tent. It's a creative challenge. <sighs> anyway, this week we're talking about six ways to save a ton of money, even if you hate budgeting. Which is good because budgeting sucks. I don't like budgeting. I hate it. Yeah, so let me put it's this dumb. up front for everyone listening to this. I, I don't keep a budget, um, and I never have. Because I've always found it more useful to just follow certain rules, like the pay yourself first rule, thing like that. And that's not to say that budgeting is not useful, because I think budgeting can be very useful, especially on shorter timescales to get a sense of how you're spending your money. Yeah. And I know you've done that. Yep. But I prefer to just follow kind of pre-programmed rules, uh, including, you know, automatically paying my bills uh, you know what? I have to. I think I have to take something back. I don't actively budget. I don't have like a. All right, this month I have 
X amount of dollars to spend on entertainment, X amount to spend on food. Yeah, categorical. But I do, Plenty. every once in a while, look at my transactions from like a bird's eye view and see roughly how much I spend on average in different categories. Uh, and I have a giant spreadsheet, which I will share in the show notes for this episode, that kind of has all of my fixed expenses on there. So, I don't know. I guess you could say I budget, but it's more like yeah, high it's, level it's not like you're ignoring money. Yeah, I'm not like it's, I'm not. I guess I'm not sitting down every single month and budgeting in the traditional sense, where I'm like, all right, here's how much money came in. Therefore, I have this much money to spend for each thing. Yeah, I'm more like this is the average that comes in. Here's the average that goes out in fixed categories. And I'm paying myself first, meaning I'm investing first. I am putting money into emergency funds first, that kind of thing. And if money's left over, then we're good to go. You're paying yourself first after the bills and stuff? Uh, in terms of timing, it's kind of hard to say. Well, I mean, like you, you like, is that your first priority or is that your first priority after you've made sure that you can pay all the bills and stuff? My first priority is paying all the bills. I've just never heard, I've never heard pay yourself first. Pay, yeah, I mean, pay yourself first is kind of a, it's an older idea in personal finance community. Um, and I think, you know, if you'd ask anybody who's popularized this idea, they would still say, yeah, you need to pay your bills because you don't want to okay. get so, out Yeah, I, did, I didn't know the context. But yeah, I guess the, the idea is um, you do, I guess, you know, you could actually pay yourself first because if you think about a 401k, that comes out of your paycheck before you even get your paycheck. So That's that true. is a form of pay yourself first. And you could definitely, as long as you ran the numbers correctly, you could say, all right, the moment my paycheck hits my bank account, I'm going to put some of it into savings, I'm going to put some of it into my investments, and the rest is going to go to my bills. Um, for me, everything's automated, and I don't know off the top of my head what the exact dates are, but in a philosophical sense, there are automated investments that are going to happen every single month, and then all of my fixed expenses are also on auto pay. So yeah. As long as I maintain a buffer in my checking account and make sure that, you know, the automatic payments aren't going to draw me down to zero, then we're good to go. But anywho, let's get into some of the things you can do to save money without budgeting. And you wrote this list. I did indeed. Uh, it looks like everything I here is not like a super specific tip involving one type of expense. So we're not going to have stuff like Stop buying lattes at Starbucks every day. This is, well, yeah, I can't tell you how to buy your lattes. Yeah. Though I bought this coffee at Caribou, and it was half the price of a latte. So. Yeah, you can also just like buy the small size, and then you've saved a bunch of money right there. What? Yeah, I know. Crazy. How, <laughs> small size? Yeah. The... I thought this was America. Uh, that's true. <laughs> this is America. I have to get my large coffee. Guns in my area. <laughs> I have to get my large coffee. Anyway... Speaking of coffee and food and drinks, first thing on our list is to eat and drink simply. Yeah, I, I think simply is the important thing here because I did not write cheaply for a reason. Mm -hmm. Because we could eat cheaply by eating nothing but, you know, like ramen noodles and Laffy Taffy for dessert. Have but, you ever seen that video would where they send like a little die. tiny camera down someone's throat along with Top Ramen and they you know, watch how the I don't actually like, watch don't... a lot of videos of stuff in people's throats. You sure? That's ki like that's gonna freak me out. You don't want to. I mean, you, what you if that, it'll make it'll feel like I'm being eaten, and then you I get that a problem. I get to join the. That's it's not for like looking at ramen noodles. We could noodles. do some digestive tract. I don't want to. Anyway, they they did this video where, I, I think they did it with like regular ramen noodles, like actually you know well made ones, and then the top ramen, and watched how quickly they were digested and how oh. much was left over. And I'm sure it's great. It's not great. So the regular noodles, they were fine, right? At yes. least they were good because they're regular. They're good noodles. Yeah, Top that, that's good because I like some noodles. I mean, it will keep you alive. It is certainly calories, but I think uh, you know, for people on all but the most restricted of budgets, there are some other choices that may not be as obvious. You yeah, know, like simple recipes that involve very very cheap ingredients. You know, potatoes, simple vegetables, maybe a sauce or two. Yeah. Or maybe some noodles that you just boil yourself instead of like. Yeah, you just buy like slightly better noodles. Mm -hmm. And it would. Or you could just drink a bunch of soylent. That's not too expensive either. At least that would be better than top ramen. It's not. I wouldn't live off of it. I but don't like, like the soylent idea. Well, I mean, it's better calories than top ramen. That's that, all. That is true. I prefer like straight, whole, good, simple foods. Yeah. But if I if I had to pick between top ramen for lunch or drinking like a protein drink out of the refrigerated section, I know exactly which one I would get. 
here's my question. Like, calorie for calorie, macronutrient for macronutrient, all that kind of stuff. Are those protein drinks actually inexpensive? Because I would imagine that they're not. I mean, probably not compared to the cheapest possible source of good nutrients. Mm. Like, how much is a Soylent thing? Because I've, I've never had it. Like, three bucks, maybe. And is that a full meal? It's like... Is uh, it supposed to be a full meal? I think it's like 400 calories and 20% of every vitamin. Huh. Well, I guess that's a decently full meal. Yeah, it's, like a snack for me. It's a me- it's like a meal replacement. Yeah, it's not a, not. Well, I guess a ton if you're trying calories. for two thousand calories a day, that's more like half of a meal. Yeah, yeah. If you're trying for two thousand, it's uh, a you know, it's a, uh, it's not the best solution, but it's better than top ramen. It is better than top ramen, but it's not my recommendation. What is your recommendation? Um, basically, just regular ingredients. You know, prepare. So prepared food is super expensive. If you buy, unless you're buying like garbage food, so I could go buy a bunch of like banquet frozen meals, but I know that that's not high quality ingredients because they're a dollar. They might taste good and they might fill me, but I will admit if you save too much money, good. Oh yeah, they taste fine. Eighteen. But if you save too much money on food and drinks, what's going to happen is you're going to spend all that money at the doctor or the dentist later on. Yeah. So it's not really a great savings. It's a short term investment that that doesn't pay off or it's short term minded um hey i mix my gasoline but if half you go to water that way i save money on gas <laughs> yeah brilliant <laughs> now you can so with the simplest foods you just you buy like potatoes cauliflower yeah you know eggs you, things that are a food mm-hmm. that there's no question about whether it's a food you just it's food and that's what you do with it those things are usually way healthier than all the processed stuff we eat yeah and they're decently cheap, like all of them. And, I mean, I, I buy, like, the certified humane cage-free eggs, too. They're the expensive eggs. But I've done the math, and if I go through and I buy nothing but just whole random fruits and vegetables and, like, eggs and stuff, it does not end up being all that expensive. The yeah. only thing is that I need to prepare. And this even accounts for Whole Foods because at one point I compared all of the three stores in our old neighborhood I literally walked around with a list of things I would buy on a grocery list, and I was like, which one's the cheapest? Whole Foods was the cheapest, actually, Yeah. because I included tofu on the list, which was uh, cheaper. I would imagine for most people it won't be the cheapest. If you buy meat, it won't be the cheapest because Whole Mm -hmm. Foods is only going to carry, like, ultra-high quality, gone-through-certain-specifications meat, which is where, like, almost all of the expense comes from Mm -hmm. because meat is expensive. So I guess that's cool, too. The the produce prices are higher. The produce prices are not higher for all of them since Amazon took over. Maybe I need to go check again. I can't remember if it was before or after the Amazon takeover, but I went in there and I noticed that onions were double the price as they were at Safeway. Were they organic? No. It was regular bulk white onions. They were a dollar a pound at Whole Foods. They were 50 cents a pound. Ooh, well, at, I, can't, uh, I can't speak to onions, Safeway. but the potatoes and a few other things were cheaper or the same exact price at Whole okay. Foods as they were at both uh, King Supers and Target. It's probably worth checking. Now, I didn't on. go to Safeway. Maybe Safeway is mystically cheaper than all three of those, but it wasn't in my neighborhood. Or wait, you went to oh King Supers? Yeah. No wait, I went to King Supers. Sorry, it wasn't okay. Safeway. It was yeah. the old King when Supers. I, when that I did reminds it, reminds me of Safeway. The Whole Foods produce prices had gone down. Okay, I would imagine once that buyout happened, it probably took a while for them to adjust pricing. It yeah, it wasn't like right overnight. And I mean, so. their whole strategy is to cut prices down, and you, yeah, you know, so like it makes sense that they would do that, but. There's this really cool video. I believe it's from uh, Jamie Oliver, who's like one of the celebrity chefs. But uh, I think it was like 10 years ago, he did this thing called Dream School, where he did like a cooking workshop with a bunch of school kids. And there's an, I think it's an eight minute video on YouTube where from start to finish, meaning the vegetables have not been cut up or chopped yet. Nothing is prepared except for it's just out on the counter. From start to finish in eight minutes, he makes like this really, really good looking plate of stir fry. Out of real simple ingredients, bell pepper, onion, some noodles. I think he throws some meat in there, maybe an egg, uh, soy sauce, maybe like one other kind of sauce, and it's done. Yeah. So If you get good at cutting the vegetables, that's like the biggest hindrance is learning how to cut the vegetables fast. But it's a skill that pays off for the rest of your life. That's an investment. Because if you can make a full plate of stir fry in five to eight minutes, start to finish, then you have a complete meal that costs probably less than $5, and you've done it in less than 10 minutes. Yeah, especially with a good knife. 
Which, speaking yes. of our investing in gear episode last time, a, a decent knife is a really, really good investment that will pay off if you cook things. Yes, and it does not have to be a fancy Japanese knife with topography designs Unless you're on me. It. Unless then it, you're you. Then it does, because it's pretty. We have one that's decently priced, but the bigger investment uh, that is going to make it even more worth it is to get a relatively inexpensive whetstone. Mm. Because no matter how nice the knife is, it's going to dull over time. Yep. And you need to know how to sharpen it quickly. So on Amazon, you can get a whetstone for like, I think I got mine for 20 or 30 bucks. Can't remember the, the amount of money, but it's going to last me for years. And, you know, every two to three months, you just sharpen the knife up and you're good to go again. Yeah. I think I've seen videos of people using whetstones. They'll take a knife from like Goodwill yes. and turn it into just this super good cutting knife. And I will say, doing that requires some skill yeah, and some time. There's a little bit of skill involved um, in that part. And the nicer knife you get, also the brand of knife you get will determine how long it will hold its edge. So I can't speak to this from personal experience, but according to Anthony Bourdain's book, Japanese knife brands tend to hold their edge a little longer because they use a different kind of steel or metal than like fancy German knives. So at least from, from his opinion, like the Wooster knives, things like that, they kind of exist on their brand notoriety. Yeah. But, and they are nice. They're really well made, but they just won't hold their edges for quite as long. So you could do a little bit of research or you could just go to Target and get. You probably you know, don't need something. like a fancy shoon knife. Shoon? Yeah. I don't have a shoon knife. That's mine. Well, Alt- Alton Brown likes them. He had, oh. he had a video talking about them. They, they work at a different angle because the slightly stronger steel allows the, the slightly sharper angle different oh is it like a different angle of sharpness yeah like is it even more acute yeah ah okay it's pretty so cool you can cut also if you do paper. if you do happen to want to invest in that stuff you can actually send that kind of a knife off to the shun people and they will sharpen it for you every time yeah and they'll forever? send they'll send it right back yeah forever that's pretty cool. sure it's forever but you got to invest in that and you have to be willing to mail your knife and then have it come back and then have you done that no, I haven't cooked enough in the last four months because I've been in the middle of moving, so it's all a disaster. That's true. But, Personal um, finance tip number two, don't get yeah, bugs so, in your house. Yeah. but uh, <laughs> with, So with food, you can save some money on food, but drinks are actually ten times more important than food. Oh, yeah. If you don't even ever want to change your eating habits, and you don't care about that, but you change your drinking habits, both alcoholic and non, but especially alcoholic if you do drink that, mm-hmm. then you will save just a ton of money. Yep. Restaurant bills cut in half. Yeah, it's it's inc- it's incredible. I remember, you know, it was, I I don't li- like drink a lot in general. But when we came to Denver, we started going to fun restaurants, and I was like, "That's a really fancy looking cocktail." I I just like to try things. I like novelty flavors. Yeah. And then I was like, "Why is everything so expensive here?" <laughs> but if it it turns out that my entire meal was the price of like one drink, yep. so I'm buying two meals, and one of them was one not good for me, <laughs> mm-hmm. and and completely nutritionally pointless and yeah. i drank it faster than i probably enjoyed the meal like yeah. but that applies to anything the protein drinks if you go and get those at whole foods you know at whole foods you can get i used to buy like a five dollar hot bar lunch mm-hmm. every day i would get there i'd get a little so some fish some berries and it would be a good nutritious lunch for like five dollars if i start buying drinks well all the fancy drinks that look fun to drink they're five six dollars seven dollars even That's by themselves true. Yeah. We really only need like water, maybe so your... maybe tea or coffee, but we don't need drinks. Yeah. Other than water, so like at your, all. Your hot bar lunch and then just bring a water bottle. Yeah, yeah or they go. yeah, if you bring your water bottle, you can fill it there. They usually have a water station. But mm. if you fall for any of the drinks, that's where most of the money is going to come from because yep. they're just I don't know how this has happened, but drinks are just crazy. And I mean, even places like maybe you could get you could get soda for cheap, but once again, your dental bills are going to mm. outpace the money you've saved buying soda, like fountain soda. And even though soda's cheap, it's actually pretty profitable. Yeah, it's really profitable for them. Like, takes a small loss on every cheeseburger they sell, but uh, they make up for it in fries and especially soda. Yeah. Because they're just buying a bulk box <laughs> of the syrup and then soda water, yeah. which is super cheap. It's... Uh, It'll, it's cheap to you, but it's even cheaper to them, and it will cost you in the long run when you have cavities in every tooth. Yeah. Don't want that. Though I do like sparkling water. 
Sparkling water is That's pretty cool. Not the it's not way cheaper to save money than regular water. Regular water. But it is cheaper than a lot of other things. So if I needed to have some sort of fun drink, not a bad choice. Yeah, exactly. And if you're already hitting your savings goals, then there's no need to try to skimp on every single expense. Yeah, that's you know? exactly why I, I put simply and why this list wasn't specific, like cut out lattes. Because if you're, if you're doing well, mm-hmm. who am I to tell you to cut out your latte? Something I thought about the other YOLO. day. YOLO. So I, I often see people on YouTube who are making $100,000 a month or more. Or, you know, you know, we used to follow Pat Flynn, and he's a good friend of mine, but he uh, had these income reports on his site where he would, he would show every single dollar that he made, every single dollar that he spent, and his net profit every month. And it was sometimes 200000 a month. Yep, so, you that's know, an, an amount of kind money. Kind of rolling in it. Uh, but I thought about it, and I'm like, I know Pat well enough. We've talked well enough. What does he do on a daily basis with all this extra money? Oh, oh, I know what it is. The same thing I do. Wakes up, probably overwhelms himself with too many tasks, works, has some time with his family, goes off and has fun sometimes. Not a very dissimilar life to my own. He's, he's other not than the like fact that he has kids. Fresh, like grade A filet mignon for every meal or something. Probably not. Probably not. That sounds inconvenient and boring, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, he lives in San Diego, but they do not even live anywhere near the beach because they have kids, and they're just like, we, we picked where we're going to live be based on schools. So he's not surfing every day. He's not going on vacation every single day. You know, the people who make 10 times more money than I do, they're still living a pretty similar life to my own, at least in, in my space. So... I kind of came to this conclusion that like there's a certain threshold that you want to work to where your bills are taken care of. You have enough of a buffer in your checking account that you don't feel stressed about small expenses. Like you want to get to the point where going out to eat with friends doesn't stress you out. But once you're there and you're steadily saving for retirement, I don't think it like makes a like you obviously you can make more money, but it's not necessarily for a survival reason. So there there is no longer a reason to skimp on reasonable improvements to your life yeah there's just no reason for it because what do you think you're going to wake up 10 years and finally hit that income that the person you admire has hit and now you're just going to relax all the time no because the money you're making like once you get to the point where you're making that money that's like the least of your concerns you probably now have like a team or a bunch of colleagues who are working on projects with you or all these other external factors that kind of hold sway over what you're doing with your time it's not the money at a certain threshold yeah this week's episode of our show is brought to you by friends over at brilliant which is an excellent learning website for anyone who wants to improve their mastery over math science and computer science brilliant has a library of over 50 in-depth courses covering calculus geometry probability statistics science courses like gravitational physics classical mechanics and computer science courses like how to program with the python language which i have done once kind of i did it with a program called sakuli script where you take screenshots of your screen and then use python to tell your screen what to do Oh, it was really cool. Nice. I saved myself eight hours of really, really tedious work in an internship once. So learning Python could be pretty useful. And they also have more fundamental courses like computer algorithms and the fundamentals of computer memory. So if you want to improve your skills in any of those areas, Brilliant is an excellent resource for it. Not least of which because they take an incredibly active approach to how they design their courses. Instead of just reading walls of text or passively intaking information the entire time, you're instead thrown into challenging sets of problems right from the get-go. And the great thing about these problem sets is that yes, they are challenging, but they're bite-sized so they're not gonna frustrate you, and they're laid out in a very logical order, which helps you to learn as efficiently as possible and stay interested. And in addition to that library of courses, there's also a feature called Daily Challenges, where every single day you're gonna get access to a couple of new problems in a variety of different areas. And these can help you to make learning and problem solving a daily habit, which can over time increase your problem solving abilities, but it can also expose you to new topic areas that you might not have explored in the past, and then you could go over to the course library and dig in even 
deeper if you wanted to keep learning. So if you want to get started for free, which will get you access to new daily challenges every single day, you can go over to brilliant.org slash college info geek and sign up. And if you want to get 20% off that premium subscription, which gets you access to the entire daily challenges archive from the past and that huge library of in-depth courses, you can sign up at brilliant.org slash college info geek and be one of the first 200 people to do so. Again, that's going to get you 20% off that annual premium subscription. Big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode and being a huge supporter of College Info Geek in general. And let's get back into the show. Okay, so what's our second thing here? Um, consider the long-term cost of habitual purchases or subscriptions. Mm. So uh, the first example I had here was a gym membership. Uh, you know, you pay 50 bucks, 30, 30, 40, 50 bucks a month, but 50 is 600 in a year. Yep. Maybe that's fine if you use it and you keep needing new um, equipment. You know, because that's like the point, right? Is yeah. you don't need to go buy the new equipment when you get too strong for this weight set mm -hmm. or something. And then, um, but if you're not using it, you're just throwing six hundred dollars down the drain, and that's yeah, that's not nothing because you could buy like some dumbbells and you could just go running outside and you could do a bunch of that once. Mm -hmm. And depending on your own exercise goals, maybe you don't even care about increasing the size of those dumbbells too much. Maybe you mostly care that you're relatively athletic and not specifically stronger. Yeah. I don't know what your goals are, but you should really consider what they are when you do these things. And, uh, you know, we talked about the lattes, but like you, a daily $5 coffee or hipster protein drink, like I was talking about, it's 150 in a month. Yeah. So that's not nothing. That's a significant budgeted item. Mm -hmm. If you just drop that to like a $2 drink instead, you've now saved $90. Yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty significant for I mean, barely you could, anything. You could start investing that every month. Yeah. And, and we've, then we've talked about like... What do you have, like 80 or 820 bucks? Or what's 12 times 9? Boy, I'm bad at this. No, it's 108. Yeah, that's the one. So you'd have $1,080 invested in principle each year. Yeah, just from just like switching your, just switching your drink. You're not even giving up the drink. You're just yeah. changing it to a different, cheaper drink, a smaller yep. drink anything it's and the thing about these habitual purchases and you know the subscriptions it's definitely just do you use this yeah if you don't you should probably cancel it but with the habitual purchases uh, an important thing to keep in mind that we've talked about before is the hedonic treadmill mm -hmm. like you get used to things the, and um, the hedonic treadmill is the idea that uh, you get used to your situation even as it gets better yeah or worse conversely but if every day for a month I drink nothing but water, I'll be fine at the end of it. If the, if the next month I think, I'm going to get a little fancier, and I start drinking $5 hipster drinks with like turmeric and matcha, then by the end of that month, I probably won't even care about those drinks. They'll be just as boring to me as the water was. Yep. The only difference is now I've built a $150 monthly habit that doesn't yeah. even bring me that much joy anymore. Mm-hmm. So, it's just become the new norm. Yeah, it's just the new normal. You, you know, and if you buy, if you had a, you know, you get your small coffee for a month and you're used to it, it's okay. But as soon as you switch to the bigger one, it's gonna be hard to switch back. You're gonna get yeah. used to the bigger one, and you're gonna get used to the expensive stuff. But you won't even be that excited. I feel called out. So like, why spend that much money on something you're not excited about? If you have money, spend it on stuff you're excited about because you know YOLO and money's to be used and such. But yeah, if you don't even care. Yeah, and even if you have money, and th this is something I think is important. Once you have money, it becomes easy to spend without thinking about it. But I, I would challenge people to think about it because there are other things you could do with that money. And if, if you're doing something that doesn't really bring value to your life, you've just hit a hedonic treadmill kind of thing, what could you be doing with that money to help the world instead? Yeah. And I'm not saying like live the life of an ascetic because you need to give all of your money away. But if you're just throwing money down the drain for no reason, could you divert that to either your own investments or charity donation or something else? Yeah, like a college fund for a, a future kid you might have. Mm -hmm. or and, and then if you don't have a kid and you just give it to some other kid and get them to – you could do lots of stuff with money. Yeah, or like that, sit down and do the math, that right? That not get bored of drinks. Maybe you want to own a house someday, but you're like, I'll never own a house – or it's going to happen in 10 years, maybe add up all these these expenses that you've sort of taken on by osmosis over time. It's like the frog in the boiling water, which doesn't actually work, but still a good metaphor. Uh, and ask yourself, like, all right, on a year-long basis, what do the savings 
from either cutting or reducing these expenses due to my goal of buying a house. Because who knows, perhaps that actually reduces the amount of time you have to wait by a year or something like that. Yeah. And that could be a motivating goal. But you don't know until you do the math. Uh, so a couple things that I like to do here when it comes to habitual purchases or subscriptions. Two calendar hacks. One, when you start a free trial, put the trial's end date on your calendar. Or actually, probably a couple of days before it. So that way you get a yeah. notification that just kind of gives you a reminder, hey, do you actually want to keep this subscription? And you can make this decision now before you're charged. That's useful. Because, I mean, free trials, most most free trials are useful because people forget about them and then they end up subscribed for a while. Yeah, that's like the whole point. That's why they yeah. set them up. And you know what? Like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't let yourself be charged for something that you unwittingly didn't really want. So try it and then make a conscious decision. Do I want it or not? Spotify, I do want it. Uh, I don't know flower delivery every single month i don't want that yeah, it turns out that was a terrible <laughs> idea <laughs> i could just get fake plants instead and then also maybe once a month or once every two months have an event on your calendar or a task in your task system that just says evaluate my subscriptions or expenses and if you have like you know a rough budget spreadsheet again i don't do the active budgeting, but I at least have a list like of every recurring subscription I have, of every fixed expense I have. And I'll look at it and be like, do I still need Zipcar? Do I still need Spotify? Just every once in a while. And if you don't, cancel them. Yeah, those things add up pretty quickly. And since they're mm -hmm. they're often related to very different things, like I'm not going to be thinking about Zipcar at the same time as I'm thinking, oh yeah, I have a Spotify subscription. Yep. Like I won't remember all of those at the same time usually. Mm-hmm. I used Zipcar in Seattle, and it was great, but uh, there's a $7 per month subscription just to be a member, mm. and you have to call them to cancel it. Ah, uh, that's I'm how like, they get ah, you. I don't want to do that, but I'm thinking about it. I'm like, when's the next time I'm going to use Zipcar in the next six months or longer, and I can't think of a time I'm going to use it because I don't have travel plans yeah. other than New York City where I would be crazy to try to drive, so I think I'm going to have to call them. I mean, I could just let them take my seven bucks a month, but no, I can invest that seven bucks a month into better coffee. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Tip three. Uh, when you're forming new habits that involve a cost. Or wait, I mean, oh, wait. We already yeah. talked about this yeah, one. Yeah, we talked about that one. <laughs> this is what happens that when you write a script That turned into tip 2.5, it turned out. Okay, so yes. Tip number three was consider the hedonic treadmill because there is a lot of yeah, diminishing we, returns. We secretly went into three and didn't tell you. Tip number four. <laughs> cool. Tip number four. <laughs> what gets measured gets managed. So this this actually sounds like active budgeting to me. No, but it's not, it's not quite budgeting because budgeting is when you limit the money based on category, at least in my opinion. You say, I have $300 mm. for this. I have $200 for this. I have $50 for this. But the opposite of budgeting is not just spending carelessly and not ever thinking about it once. So, And you, you don't have to do this all the time. But if you keep a log somewhere of what you spend each day, even for just a week or two, mm -hmm. you can come out with this knowing where your problem spendings might be. Gotcha. And I, I did this for a little bit. And the useful thing that happened was every day, and I was doing this simply, just a rounded number of mm -hmm. what I had spent. Um, so each day I'd be like, oh, I spent $12. Oh, I spent $23 today. Today I spent $60. And I just have them written down there. But I would be watching those numbers and I'd be like, wait, I didn't want to go higher than that. And then the next day I would intentionally oh. try to spend less because okay. I was aware that I had spent more the previous day. Yeah. And like, I don't know, I'm not keeping a running total. I'm not t paying that much attention to the budgeting side of it. It's more like, I'm trying to not spend money without thinking too hard about it. Mm -hmm. And just going through and saying, what did I spend today? Made me aware of when I started buying things that were unnecessary. Like, why did I, why did I buy all this stuff today? There was no reason. I bought one expensive thing and then said, oh, well, and then just bought a bunch of other things. So this number's 10 times that number. That's stupid. Yeah. And it's funny when you buy one expensive thing, it makes everything else seem yeah. super cheap. I remember I went into... Uh, suit supply and I bought a suit and then after I had said I was going to buy the suit the salesman's like oh do you want to look at ties and pocket squares and 
the ties I think were 50 bucks a piece and the pocket squares, this is a big one, the pocket squares were also 50 bucks a piece. Now when I had walked into the store, had he asked me to look at ties and pocket squares right away, I would have been like 50 bucks for a pocket square, which is just a square piece of shiny fabric. Yeah. No, thank you, sir. But I had already committed to buying a $500 suit. And after that, I'm like, oh, that's only 10% of what the suit costs. And it's really going to yeah. complete the look. And all these people who said, like, you got to have a pocket square. So I bought the pocket square, which was stupid. Definitely a purchase that I regret, especially since I took the suit to the StyleCon conference. And then my friend Aaron gave me a pocket square for free. It <laughs> <laughs> looked yeah. better. <laughs> So That's I just wasted 50 bucks. Uh, the tie was pretty nice. Don't know. I don't, I don't really know what ties should cost because I've heard people say like $10 ties from random, you know, bulk tie websites are not actually that nice. And I think the tie that I got is pretty nice. But 50 bucks for a pocket square. Man, I could have just put a napkin in there and nobody would have known. That, that would have been like a power move. I don't <laughs> care about your social needs. That actually is a power napkin. move. Napkin. Have a really nice suit. That's like Bad nicely pins. tailored. You have a perfect tie. You have the tie clip, your hair is perfectly styled. Boom, McDonald's napkin in the breast pocket. Yeah. <laughs> That'll show them. <laughs> that honestly is a pretty good power move. But, or like a microfiber cleaning cloth for your iPhone. Well, it's at least that's, that's useful. That is useful. Yeah. But yeah, yeah microfiber like microfiber pocket square. Come on. We'll fight really hard to save twenty dollars on like, oh look, we got a coupon, but then yep. as soon as it comes to like buying a big thing, yeah, it just it disappears. It's the same amount of money. Yeah, you're, it just you're doesn't seem car, like it in the moment. And they're like, all right, you're going to buy this $20,000 car. Now let's talk about the warranties. This one is 30 bucks a month. This one's 50 bucks a month. Doesn't matter in my mind. Yeah, you would totally try to cut that normally. But with mm-hmm. a car, you just, I don't care. And, yeah, so and now, what do they call it? The anchoring effect? I think, maybe. Like your, maybe your they call it that. Anchor to one number, and that makes everything else seem different in comparison. That sounds right. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and, uh, and when I was doing this, when I was tracking how much I'm spending each day, um, first of all, I get text notifications when my cards are used, which also which is good to yeah, set up. But so so I was just able to scroll through some texts from the pre, from today, round the numbers, add them, and so it was easy. But I was also okay. only tracking volu- voluntary expenses because it feels bad to see that number huge when it wasn't my fault. Like oh, if a the bill, power bill came in, like today. yeah, like that that makes me feel like a failure. But I didn't do it, so that's not part of this. Yeah, but. The reason I was doing this is because it, it's kind of another way to combat how credit cards and debit cards feel. You just, yes. no matter what the number is at the store, I'm not going to take any items back. I'm just going to say, yep, I wanted it. Here's my card. Yep. And, and that's like, I'm not considering the real cost when I do that usually. And this helped put real numbers onto the, my magic plastic money thing. Dude, it's going to be even worse if stores become like that Amazon Go thing. Yeah. Where you just walk And they're in. gonna take even more of my money easily. Because at least now you gotta go through the checkout lane. You have to scan each item and you at least see a total. I mean it's not as good as cash, because with cash you're literally parting with the physical thing you have. Yeah, that's the most real feeling one. That's probably the best way to do it. But if like, you feel like you have a I spending hate problem, cash. you could go to cash for a while and I was talking with Anna about this yesterday and she was saying how she really liked being in Japan because it's virtually cash only there. And every time you want to buy something, it's just, all right, how much cash should I take out today? Took out a hundred bucks. That's what I have to spend. So I'm, I have to make, you know, deliberate choices with how I yeah. part with this stack of paper I have. Whereas with the credit card, you're so disconnected from it. Yeah. And that, that's why I was trying to do this. I get the instant text. that's like, you just spent $20. I'm like, that was $20. Mm-hmm. I didn't even realize that was twenty dollars. Good thing I just got notified. Oh, there are a few channels I've seen on YouTube where they do like budgeting challenges. So it'll be like, uh, you know, I, I ate for one dollar a day in New York City, and we can link to one of those in the show notes. I think uh, Nathaniel Drew had also made one for Mexico City, which obviously cheaper than most major cities here. But I would imagine not not a not as cheap as you would think. Like, definitely cheaper, but... Yeah. I don't know. I think you could find ways, even in the U.S. or more, I don't know, expensive country, to eat for pretty cheap and still keep it pretty healthy. Yeah. I don't know if I could do a dollar. A dollar might be hard. I, that will scare me away. Actually, yeah. How, could you do a dollar? I don't know. 
actually, no, you could easily do a dollar. Now, you probably couldn't do a dollar every single day for a very long period of time. Uh, like a dollar average You could buy a potato. Something. And I think you could get a potato and a small onion for one dollar, and that would probably keep you going for the day. You'd be hungry, but a full I potato. I don't well, know how many calories see, are in a full potato, but it's a good amount. You need to take that potato, stick it in some dirt, and grow more potatoes. Boom. Now that's thinking. Infinite money from 50 cent potato. Now you're a farmer. Nobody's thought of this before. No, you could totally scam person. the grocery stores. You just take one potato from there. You yeah. put it in the ground. You make all of your own potatoes. You know what you could do, actually? You could sell some of those potatoes. Sitting outside the Whole Foods? You're like, I got cheaper potatoes. Yeah. What's up? Or what if you didn't even do it at the Whole Foods? What if you went to like like a place where like you know other other scammers were, and they were like, selling some of their other scammed they're all They're all scammers. We'll call it a scammer's market. Yeah. It's, it's genius. <laughs> Why has no one ever thought about you're, doing You're all this? scamming capitalism. Give me back my profits. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there was one more thing I wanted to say here, but I, can't, I got off topic with the whole $1 a day thing. Oh, I was going to ask you, what's the easiest way to track how much you're spending in a day? Because... I'm imagining like pulling out my phone and trying to type it in after every transaction. And that sounds annoying. Oh, no. So, yeah, for me, it was getting the text alerts. I would literally scroll through the number my bank texts me from, and I would just add it up and write it in a square in a grid notebook. And mm-hmm. each square would be a day, and I would just see okay. them right next to each other. Cool. I rounded it. I only did voluntary expenses. I cut out as much possible overhead because that's what makes budgeting annoying. Yeah. And that's also why I hate cash, but... You know, cash is useful, but I wanted I wanted the card to be somehow responsible. Yeah. So I would just average that out throughout the day. I guess, yeah, I wouldn't want to do it each time I spend something, then pull out my phone and type it in. Yeah. That might help. That might help associate the cost with each transaction better. True. But I wanted to make it simple. Um, but with those texts, so you're at least saying the, like the text one messages. Per. Yeah, one. Yeah. It's it's one per, and but I just scroll through and I'm like. 12, 5, 7, just add it up, just mm-hmm. write it down. I don't know if I could make it simpler than that. Maybe I could. I haven't tried recently. It's been a bit. That sounds like the most simple way to do it. You could it's also like just you look keep through the it receipts. all at once. Yeah, I always forget that, though. And then when I forget to, to ask for one receipt, I'm like, well, mm-hmm. the day's ruined because now I have yeah. to log into my bank and figure out which one that was. Yeah, and then fair. I just give up. That's fair. Because I, I messed up one receipt, so it's not perfect data, so I don't care anymore. Okay. I think um, getting texts for every single transaction is probably the way to do it. Yeah, I just got and texted also, now, actually. So I think mine is set up to text me anytime more than 20 bucks is spent. Or maybe it's, it's notification, it's not a text. But I should probably change this because somebody stole my debit card information once, and the first transaction that was fraudulent was three bucks. Yeah, that's how they get you. So they test it. I caught it a lot earlier if I had every single transaction set up. Yeah, I have that set up. And uh, while I was out, I was driving back to Iowa for some family stuff in the summer. And then somebody in Colorado Springs spent my debit card on like $350 worth of car stuff mm. and then like a bunch of gas too. And I was like, I'm not in Colorado Springs, but I immediately got the texts. Yeah. Just like, that's not me. I'm calling my bank. Oh, the one also, nice I never about. used that card. I don't even know how they got the number. So this is this is kind of a security tip, but uh, number one, use your credit card. If you have a credit card, use your credit card for everything, not your debit card. Yeah. As you know, you, We have to talk about the expense ratio thing. Like You don't want to spend more than 20% of your available credit. But Yeah, don't spend too much on your credit card. I try as much as I possibly can to not use my debit card anywhere. I, especially I'd never use it online in online transactions Yeah. because credit cards have fraud protection. If somebody fraudulently charges your credit card and you catch it in time and you have a pretty good amount of time, you will not lose that money. Yeah, I didn't the have to pay for it. just be like, oh, that was that. fraudulent. With a bank, you can recover, but the money literally gets taken out of your account the moment they use your debit card. So it's more of a hassle and you could so have a situation you have to where wait they to get it back. Bank. And yeah, and they could have like drawn your bank account down. They could have incurred an overage fee. It could be a whole headache. So yeah, I try to not use my debit card anywhere. Yeah, I like also that fixed protection. expenses. My credit card gets me rewards. So why would I ever use my debit card anyway? 
Yeah. Unless there's like yeah a for fixed receipt. expenses. Yeah, there's no reason not to get the rewards. But yeah, yeah I just I called him. I was like, that that ain't me. And they were like, is there any mm-hmm. chance it was you? And I was like, well, if you look at my other card, which I actually use, you'll see that I was driving back through Nebraska that day, and therefore not in mm-hmm. Colorado Springs. And they were like, ah. Good point. And then I just got all my money right back. Yep. Didn't affect me at all. I mean, the person got away with it. They got their $380 worth of stuff. Mm. It, unless they get caught later, they still got it. They got their services. And but the thing is, the credit card companies don't even necessarily care about a money amount. Like, to me, that's like, that's like 300 bucks. But there's a credit card company, they're just like, eh. They literally have a fraud budget. They, yeah, they've budgeted for this. They mm-hmm. don't. They don't care. And you know what? Of doing Out of all the fraud they deal with, that's probably not the worst. But it was really simple. It's like the, uh, you know, the cost of hiring an exterminator to get some cockroaches out of your kitchen if you're a restaurant or something. It's yeah, they're just it's, cockroaches it's not, it's stealing your money. Deal. You know, they, they're annoying, but it's gonna happen. Um. Oh, I was gonna say the at least with Capital One, the app will let you turn your credit card off. And I oh. don't even think you have to report it stolen or missing or anything. You can literally just say, it's deactivated right now, and I can reactivate oh, it. Like, I'm not using this again. card right now. I'm on vacation, so yep. stop it. Or if you notice As long something. as you don't have any bills coming to, to that card. Mm-hmm. So that can be useful to do. Uh, and I think that's all we have on that section. So tip and revive. Keep a 30-day list for new purchases. I think this is a really, really helpful one. Yeah, this is, also, this is kind of a counterbalance to the when to self-invest episode, too, because mm-hmm. this, this goes along with it really well. So the idea here is when you decide you want something, as long as it's something you don't need right now, put it on a 30-day list, which means you come back 30 days from now and you ask yourself, do I still want that? If you do, it's probably a decent idea to get it as long as you can afford it. If you don't, then you have just successfully avoided imp- impulse purchase. Yeah, and you probably are not going to get, I would say, more than half of the things that go on that list. Yeah, probably not. I mean, the point of most marketing and where they put stuff in the store and how they mm-hmm. make you walk around the store in a certain direction, it's all to like inspire you to make impulse purchases. That's the point. That's yep. what they want. They're our friends because they're helpful, but they're also our enemies because they want to take all of our money. We can't just go mm-hmm. along with their plans. Yeah, exactly. And I guess one thing to ask yourself is not only do I still want that, but would my life during the previous 30 days have been better Yeah. if I had bought that thing? It was something I noticed this morning. So I was driving through the neighborhood and remember when we first toured the neighborhood, we were taking in everything and every little thing was so cool and it was amazing that it was in our life. Like, yeah. hey, look at all these trees and like the trees actually do do mean quite a lot to me but driving to my neighborhood this morning i was only focused on going to get a coffee somewhere uh hedonic treadmill gotcha like you know what i didn't notice a lot of this stuff though i did notice that the park had this like bed of fog in it and it was beautiful Ooh, like a nice fog but a lot of the elements that i had been so fixated on when i was evaluating the house in the neighborhood i just glossed over them and that's not to say that i don't like them but i didn't care anymore and that is very similar to how I feel about many of the things that I thought I cared so much about in the past. There are certain things where it's like, yep, this was super worth it, and it improves my life every single day that I use it. For example, I recently ordered a very expensive film tripod, which has these levers at the top that let you move the legs up and down, all three at the same time. Uh, That's going to improve my life. Yeah. As a YouTuber, I know it is going to because every single time I have to do B-roll filming and I have to stop and undo nine different levers for the tripod legs and then hope that it's level, it sucks. So that will be worth it. But certain other things, did that really matter? Nah, it didn't. Like, did the bigger TV matter? Not really. Yeah. I'd say my biggest thing that I... I have a bad habit of purchasing because I don't wait for it. I pre-order almost every video game that I want. (laughs) And then you don't play it. And then, so I literally have like, I've got to have at least 20 games that are still in their plastic. You're like the Steam library people, except for it's physical games. Just because I really want to play them. I love video (laughs) games, but I underestimate how busy I am with other stuff. 
So I just you don't do realize that if you don't get pre-order to it, it, you can still go buy it for the same price. I was trained during the days of uh, I don't remember what it might have been the 3DS, but there was a time where most of the obscure Nintendo titles I wanted would actually oh, would sell out. out. Mm, okay, it would it was a bit of a problem. I don't need to pre-order literally all of them. Yeah, but I I do. And then I end up with all these new games, and I could. That's quite a few hundred dollars of unused game mm-hmm. that I have. I think that. So I could, I could probably change that habit and save a bunch of money. With only one exception, every new release game I have bought near the release window, I've not finished or even put a significant amount of time into. The only game I can think of that I have purchased at full price and really got value out of was Overwatch. Mm. And I mean, I definitely got my money's worth off of Overwatch. But uh, I went and I bought Sekiro near the time it came out. Yeah, full you were going to play that. Played probably three hours of it. And I like to tell myself, I'll get back to that game sometime. But yeah. I have bigger priorities no, you in life. I, I haven't made you, an album yet. You barely play you know? games. And when I do play okay. games, I just play Hollow Knight over again. And you know how much Hollow Knight was? 15 yeah. bucks. And That's I've exactly put like 100 it. hours into it. Like I, the recent, <laughs> most recent game I took the time and I was like, I have to play this. I will make time for it. Was the Celeste extra bonus chapter. That was free. Wasn't that free? And I've, <laughs> I've purchased games since I beat Celeste that I haven't played. But mm-hmm. And, you know, I thought I didn't have time. And then as soon as the Celeste DLC came out, I was like, there will be time. And I yep. made it happen. So clearly my priorities are stronger for some things than others. And I don't, I don't really think about it. I just think that game must be important to me. Yeah. But it's it's, it's it's hard to know. Often not. Also, I beat that DLC. 4,000 deaths. That was a lot. But that's how much I tried. That's pretty impressive. Other people didn't need that many deaths. But <laughs> I think it would you take gotta, 10,000. You have to try hard sometimes. Yeah, you do. But yeah, it, it's, it's hard to know, you know what's going to be the next Celeste DLC and what's going to be the next Sekiro for you. So the 30-day list will help give you clarity. Yeah. Because I, w- I will admit, the Sekiro thing... I was like, you know what? It would be so cool to play like a really technically difficult game. And I know I didn't play Dark Souls or Bloodborne, but Sucker will be different because you can like grapple up to trees and stuff. And that particular feature you know does what? make a big difference. Well, also I thought it'd be less in whether you're busy because it's in feudal Japan instead of like a weird gothic horror nightmare place. And I do agree with that part, mm. but I'm a baby when it comes to games. So this is true. That probably doesn't matter to most people. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so what you have here is some things aren't compatible with a 30-day list, which brings us to our final tip. Don't invest too quickly in new ideas or hobbies, which we talked about in great detail Yeah. last week, last two weeks ago. I don't remember. This is one of those bonus episodes that's not on a bi-weekly schedule. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know when it came out. But yeah, so, some episode. of the things don't really work at the 30-day list because you need to try it during the 30 days to know if you'll want it Mm -hmm. after 30 days. Like uh, if I wanted to learn an instrument or I wanted to try out rollerblading, things like that. I I still, I can wait 30 days, say I still want to rollerblade, buy them, and then say I'm terrible and I hate this. Like the 30 days wouldn't have helped me because I needed the experience. Well, here's a good test. Ask yourself what made you want to do the thing. Did you see a guitar in the store and think, I want to do that? Because that sounds like impulse buying based on seeing a thing you could buy. Yeah. Or did you see somebody playing guitar and you got inspired or you just love listening to guitar music and you've always wanted to do it? That doesn't sound like consumption-based impulse decision. That sounds like something that you might want to do. And it still doesn't mean that you're going to do it long term, but at least you know your motivations aren't based on advertising or store placement or consumerism yeah so it's more likely to be a reasonable thing Mm -hmm. in that situation but like i could i could go out think i'm gonna i'm gonna love piano i'm gonna do this and i mean i personally do but in this example let's just ignore that and i buy a piano for you know like a thousand minimum i'm just gonna say a thousand dollars i bought a really really cheap acoustic somehow you can get cheaper acoustics you can get it for free on craigslist oh well i'm as long as you can that's a good idea skateboards if you can do that home you're going to have to invest in good skateboards. Remember when we were young and didn't have cars? Yeah, I we carried, did all sorts I of carried all everything. I had to, we, we went to Home Depot once to build like a skateboarding box that we could do grinds on. 
<laughs> so we we got like a giant sheet of plywood and like carried it home three miles and we'd have to put it down every five minutes or so. Yeah. <laughs> I did that with my uh, friend Aaron. We bought an aquarium and a whole bunch of fish and mm. we just carried it down the train tracks for a mile or two <laughs> with like the fish in the bags and everything. Just like, we're going home, fishy. Yep. But uh, yeah. Anyway, with the, with the piano, it's like I could buy it. I could be amused for a few months, then get bored and not yes. care anymore. It's, it was just a fun phase during which I may regret purchasing a piano, but I can rent one for pretty cheap. That's right, you can. I did rent one. I can get access to things. Uh, largely here, I would suggest just seeing if you can rent things or go to a location where you can try stuff out. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, if you go to a church, sometimes you might be able to be like, hey, could I, could I like try out this piano slash organ thing? That's could I play I with this? And that's, that's an available resource. If you go to you know, some colleges, you they'll have need to music go to rooms. That church. Yeah, pro probably. Probably should just like walk into a church and be like, "Hey, I'm, I'm going." I here, mean, but. maybe they'd let you, but I would lean more if you did go to it. And then colleges, they'll have music rooms and stuff. You mm -hmm. might be able to do that. You might be able to take. I took a community college piano course just because I was bored, and I was like, "That'll be a fun way to spend the day." Yeah. And you know, that was basically just piano lessons with the ability to play all the time. Mm -hmm. All of those were much cheaper and easier than buying a piano which was a huge decision that took me years and years and years yeah well a friend of mine actually has one of my guitars right now because he was like i've always wanted to play guitar and i said well i have an old electric that i'm not using here you go you can borrow it and here's my amp you can borrow so he'll give it back someday but now he's got a way to see if it's something he wants to do yeah and if you don't have a friend with an old electric sitting around, you could go to the guitar club at your school or something, and you could just be like, hey, I don't have a guitar, but I'm interested. Does somebody have one they can lend me, or can I like try out one or something like that? And more often than not, you're going to find somebody who's willing to help you out. Yeah. And I think the big danger here is that you'll, with any of these things, like a new pair of rollerblades, you want to get out and exercise more. Mm -hmm. Do I know if I want rollerblades or a longboard or a bike? I don't, oh, yeah. I don't know which one of the solutions to the thing I'm trying to do is the best for me. Or I'm playing an instrument. Maybe I don't have the embouchure for bassoon. Maybe I need to play clarinet. The what? <laughs> I'm the just, embouchure? I'm just, uh, you know, uh, that. Is that just a word you throw out in casual conversation? Well, mostly I'm just quoting over the garden wall. But it's uh, oh, okay. the way you form your mouth uh, <laughs> gotcha. with the thing to make the sound. I'm yeah. not an expert in those instruments and cannot play them very well. Mm -hmm. But... If you were like, actually, I think I'm more of a bass player, and you just spent a whole bunch of money on a guitar, you were right about music, but you were wrong about the specific details. So yeah. being able to try it out might help you better solve a long-term urge Though, to do something. Isn't there something to be said for the whole, like, grass is greener thing? You get a guitar, and you're like, this is hard, man. I feel like bass would be easier. Well, I, well, I wouldn't spend <laughs> forever choosing like that. Yeah. There is a danger there. Mm -hmm. You might hesitate forever. Yeah, I don't know. I, I switched between rollerblading and skateboarding and BMXing when I was a kid. Uh, and I think a lot of times that switch was like, oh, I've reached a point where it's hard now. You know, it'd be easier inline skating. That is very much a danger, especially if stuff comes to you naturally a lot yeah. of the time. You get used to, hey, I don't have to try very hard and I can ace this class. And then the second you start failing one, you're like, what is, what is trying? I'm dropping out. This yeah. class is stupid. So however you try the thing you want to try, find a way to commit to it for a while. Yeah. Be wary, be you, wary of the dip, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Or, be like, you know, commit to it before you decide to switch to something else that requires another purchase. You know? And for guitar, if you want to go to bass, just get a, um, what's it called? Pitch shifter pedal. There you go. Oh, yeah. And all the bassists in the audience are going to be pissed at me now because it's not the same. But uh, it's close. <laughs> it's close <laughs> the feeling is not there i will admit the feeling you can't like play with two fingers quite as well um you know the, the string thicknesses are very different but you can get kind of the same sounds yeah you know but i would say you know commit to the thing that you're trying to do before you buy a different alternative thing and if after a while you're like all right nope i don't like this element of it it's not working out for me then maybe switch yeah yeah so there it is all right, so everybody that's listening is rich now. They're all rich, even though we didn't talk about how to make more money. No, they saved so much that, like, if you save enough money, you're owed money by someone. You know what? 
I don't know if this story is true or not, but my mom, my mom's best friend, she has eight kids. And um, when I was a little kid, we had moved into the dorms of this like Bible college where my dad was going to school. And that's how they met. So at that time, I think she had four kids, but they had to be incredibly frugal given that they were in Bible college and, uh, you know, not making a ton of money. So my mom's like, yeah, Laura came back from a store that she had brought a bunch of coupons to, and they ended up owing her money (laughs) somehow. And I don't think they gave her the money. They just let her walk out with all the stuff for free. There's there's like no way they'd give it to her. That'd be ridiculous. Crazy coupon arbitrage combination thing that was totally legit, but ended up with a negative balance from what she was buying. So yeah, there you go. uh, Save money hard enough. I guess you're owed money. Now, technically, you could do that. Uh, I will personally advise that if you don't have a passion for couponing, that you could spend that same time focusing on how to make back like the twenty dollars. Yeah, you were going to spend on food. That's true. Obviously, for some people, it works out. But I can't. It's not more. If you have a way that you might like focus on a career type thing instead, that's probably a better long term investment. I can't say I've ever received a coupon for just potatoes. It's usually like like stuff I don't want. And usually the amounts aren't, it's kind of like gas prices. You know, it's like I could go down to this one and it's like five cents cheaper. But if I have a 10 gallon tank and at 50 cents, like why am I driving all the way down there? This one's on the way. Oh, but speaking of gas, that is a good way to save money. Um, If you have a grocery store that gives you gas rebates, on your purchases that's true now you gotta worry or you gotta watch out for like are you know are they increasing the prices versus other stores my mom was very good at figuring out which grocery store is actually the best they do have good price. deals like that if you're not too far away though because if you're driving like yeah. 20 miles away to get you well my mom's your like gas points doesn't make any sense my mom's like equidistant from like the regular grocery store but then an aldi and a walmart mm. and she's like this stuff is cheaper at walmart this stuff is cheaper at aldi so she usually just goes to those two and she knows mm. the exact differences. And she's she probably knows how much gas it costs her to drive between them as well, which yeah. is very little because they're pretty close to each other. But, uh, yeah, I don't do that. But I did appreciate when, I don't know, every few months or so, I just check how many gas points I had on my card from groceries and be like, oh, you're going to save 50 cents a gallon, which is pretty good, actually. At that point, you're saving, like, five dollars yeah you're, i mean you're saving a pretty significant amount that's a drink my car is like i don't know 15 gallon tank or something like that mine's been 10 both times well now mine's 12 but who cares about that in this situation yeah it's barely different but either way like you can save a pretty decent amount of money yeah as long as they're your normal grocery purchases and yes you're not like that's the thing about coupons every time i get a coupon it's like oh hey next time you want to buy a box of ice cream bars you can get two and you get like 50 cents off the second <laughs> one i'm like all right so what you're gonna actually have me do is spend two dollars and fifty cents go home with more ice cream bars still eat them all in one night because i have no self-control yeah, they're not gonna last you any <laughs> that's a foolish thing to think <laughs> and i will have diminishing enjoyment of the last ones but it won't keep me from eating them do you do that do you do the thing where where you're like i'm i, I want to start eating healthy but that means i have to finish all this ice cream right now so that it's so that it's not there because I definitely I, always, every time, do that. I don't make that justification, but if I buy ice cream, I will eat it way faster than I intend to. Like, I'll, So here's what will happen. I'll get like a pint of Haagen-Dazs, and I'll eat a reasonable amount that night. But then the next day, I'll just like, oh, you've in got the middle the of the day, yep, oops, it's gone. So what I've learned that I have to do is not keep it around. Yeah, well, it's very much the same thing exact for me. same exact thing. I have to actually I have to drink like water or something afterward because if I leave the taste mm. of the dessert in my mouth, I'll just keep going back to it. Yep. Every every little bit. Yeah. But every it's time I want to get, I'm like, I'm gonna be healthy. I'm gonna stop eating this. So I'm gonna eat two pints of ice cream today so that tomorrow <laughs> I'll be healthy. <laughs> I don't do that because I'm a genius. I don't do that. Usually my my go to there is like, all right. If I'm if I'm having a craving and I have enough self discipline, I will get full off of something better first. I'm like, all right, gotta make a smoothie, and then I'll be full. And it's like, there's no room for ice cream. 
That did, we're good. That you didn't find a way to justify eating both pints of ice cream, though. I didn't. There Which you go. Which is good. That's the, no, that's your failure. <laughs> is it? <laughs> All right, I'll get right on eating those two pints of ice cream. I'll never buy two pints of ice cream at once. That is a recipe it's for a bad disaster. Bad, but what if there are two flavors? Uh, that's okay because I only really care about one flavor. Oh, okay. Because Safeway does not have uh, chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream mm. in Haagen Dots flavor, which is the only uh, brand that I care about there. I buy they a only lot of have, novelty flavors. They only have Belgian chocolate. That's the only one I want. Seasonal flavors are how every single company gets me. Now, if they started time. selling salt and straw ice cream at Safeway, I'd be finished. You can buy it online. <laughs> Don't tell me that. <laughs> Don't you dare tell me that. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Oh, though. If you start it, you'll never stop. I know we talked about idea. preparing simple foods, but uh, time is a big thing for me. And we found in Seattle this place called Eat Local where you can order like pre-made meals. They're basically just like TV dinners except for they're healthy. And you can you can order them based on uh, whatever diet you're on. So you oh, Yeah, they had a bunch of vegan, options. Vegetarian, keto, primal, um, Mediterranean all kinds of other ones and you can order them online not from the local foods website i think you have to or eat local website i think you have to only be in sale for those ones but they said they have some distributor okay i don't remember i was like luvo foods or something like that but and then there's like, i'm gonna look into the cost per meal on that because there are nights when i just don't want to cook like, sorry you know i'm getting better at stopping work at a certain time but once i do that sometimes anna and i just want to play games together yeah, and in those cases, it's better to have like, what like uh, what are the other ones like freshly things yes. things like that. Even if if it's just occasionally, it might be a little more expensive, but it's yeah. You just you got to weigh the cost per meal. Probably better for your health, which on, is very much worth considering. Yeah, versus your time, versus how much money you have in disposable income. You know, and if if the math works out in favor of doing that and it's good, then do it. You know, though I would like to find a local place personally. Yeah. One thing I don't Me like too. about I the hate fresh the packaging for I them. don't like the packaging, especially because you like it's ridiculous. You get these packs of like ice packs, and you have to figure out how to get rid of them without mm. destroying the environment. I'd rather just go, just give it to me. Yeah, it's really cool that they were local. That'd be nice yes. to find something like that around so here. Perhaps there's something in Denver like that. I don't know. Anywho, I think that'll do it for this episode. I know you have something coming up this morning. Some kind of, I don't know, like yeah. cabaret. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, that's what it is. Is it? Anywho, um, what is this? Episode 277, I think. Is that true? That's big numbers. I had no shit we doing open big numbers. on my phone, but I didn't have it open on my iPad. So We win it. I believe this is episode 277. So the one, one thing I don't like about Notion is it seems to log me out more often than ever I hate that because I don't have email on my devices, so every like I can't get the code without going to my computer. That is annoying. Okay, so yes, this is episode 277, which means you can find the show notes for this episode, including that dope Jamie Oliver video where he makes stir fry in five minutes or something like that, which I think is, it's a must watch. Because it's just eye-opening how fast he makes it. And yeah, yeah he's an expert, but man, 10 minutes. Uh, so check that out over at cigpodcast.com slash 277. Or you can go over to CIGpodcast.com with no slashes or anything at the end of it to figure out how to subscribe to the show. You can do so on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. Weird smoke signals in the forest that you somehow transform into acoustical signals through a smoke to acoustic digital device that you created. Watch out for the forest, though. Watch out for the forest, though. Only you can prevent forest fires. Only you, Jared specifically no one else <laughs> i can't do it i'm not even going to try uh otherwise if you want to support this show a great way to do it is to share it with a friend uh, maybe send them your favorite episode and they might start listening as well or over on apple Podcasts, there is a rating and review system so if you want to give us a rating and review tell us what you think that helps us bump up the charts i think i'm really just guessing about the algorithm at this point but that's what every podcast no one thinks. knows so we're all like lemmings you know give us some apple podcast reviews Probably just benefits Apple Podcasts. Probably. Big brain moment. 
<laughs> or go over to collegeinfogeek.com, check out our articles, videos, resource pages. We have a list of our favorite books for students, our college packing guide, all kinds of other cool resources. So that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks for hanging out with us and we will see you in next week's episode. Stay cute.